All right, so I'm going to focus in here on this chapter. We see in this chapter 3 that the Apostle Paul is given kind of a warning here, and he says, and he's repeating himself. He starts off and finishes kind of on the same thought. He starts off saying, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. He's saying, if I'm coming off sounding a little repetitive here, he's like, it's fine. I have no problems repeating myself. It's not grievous to me. It's not a bad thing. He says, but for you, it's safe. You know, there's, there's some things that in the Bible that we need to hear over and over again for our own good, for our own safety, so that we can, we can be aware of these things and kind of keep them at the forefront of our mind. And what he's talking about here are evil people. At the very end of the chapter... He's telling us, he says, for many, uh, many walk, in verse 18, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. He says, I've been warning you about these people. Even now it's bringing tears to my eyes, thinking about these wicked people are out there to destroy. He says that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. There is an enemy. We are in a spiritual warfare today. It's different than a physical warfare, right? The physical one, you can see, you know what's going on, you can see your enemy coming at you, and things are much more clear in a physical confrontation. We're in a spiritual warfare. There are enemies of Christ out there. Yes, there are bad, evil people. And this is, if, if, I, if I drive nothing else home this morning, and if you disagree with my sermon this morning, just at least use this to realize that there are wicked people out there. And, you know, for most normal people, Especially for those that are saved, it, 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 it is a very foreign concept to even understand that there are people in this world that literally ponder and think and, and intend to cause harm to other people and to do bad things to people. But they exist. Just because you may not be able to even comprehend, how could that even possibly happen? Who, who in their right mind? You know, well, they're not in their right mind, but... Regardless of that, there are people that are out to destroy. And the Apostle Paul here is, is, is really trying to stress. He's like, look, I'm, even now I'm weeping, just trying to explain that you would please get this through and understand. I've told you often that there are enemies of the cross of Christ. And he describes these people, he says in verse 19, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. Now, keep some of these attributes in mind as we continue through the sermon. You're going to find these attributes repeated over and over again as we discuss the topic this morning. And the title of my sermon this morning is Beware of Dogs. Now, I get that from verse number two in our chapter here, because in verse two he says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. Dogs in the Bible is referenced, is talking about basically really wicked people. And we're going to see in a little bit, if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 56, I'm going to be dealing with the, with the subject of reprobates this morning. Okay, and I'm going to get into that definition in just a minute. Actually, we'll just do it right now. In Jeremiah chapter 6, you could just stay in Isaiah 56. In Jeremiah chapter 6, this is the first mention of the word reprobate. It's mentioned five times in the Bible. This word is used five times, the word reprobate. And in Jeremiah 6 verse 30, the first time that word's used, the Bible says, Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. So we get the definition and the meaning of this word reprobate right in the context of Scripture. He's saying they're called reprobate because God has rejected them. And even if you go to a dictionary, it'll tell you the word reprobate means rejected. It means they, are, they have just been rejected by God. Okay, And that's what the word reprobate means. There are... Um, other mentions of this in the Bible, as I said, um, keep, your, you know, keep a bookmark in Isaiah 56, because I, I went a little bit out of order for what I was going to do, but that's fine. I think it's more important to get this foundation down first. Isaiah 56, keep a bookmark there. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 12. This is all extremely important. This is a slightly deeper topic this morning, but it's, it's, it's really not a, a difficult concept to understand, but there's a lot of scriptural evidence for it, and it's important that we get this scriptural evidence because, honestly, this is, a, this is the type of sermon, this is going to offend people. 
Now, whether or not the people in this room get offended, I don't know. But this is the type of sermon that will offend people, guaranteed. It's going to make people angry. It's going to make people mad. And, what I, and I don't normally give disclaimers for my sermons. But what I ask this morning is that you look at the scriptural evidence. Put away your preconceived ideas. We live in a world, and you know what, honestly, the reason why people get angry at the, at the sermon I'm going to preach this morning is because they're brainwashed. Because they've been brainwashed by the media, by the music, by the movies, by the Hollywood, by all of these things that, that, are, that are teaching us to accept sin and that are teaching us to, to be just tolerant of everything and everything's okay and be very permissive with, with, with all types of sin. And we are being programmed to, be, to thinking that way. And honestly, this is why people get really upset at these sermons, because you're being bombarded with this all the time. And if you're not spending very much time in this book, you're going to lose your grasp of how we should view sin and how we should view these subjects if you're just constantly hearing the world's point of view, Satan's point of view versus God's point of view on what we're teaching about this morning. So keep that in mind. In the word reprobate, see in John chapter 12, and what people, the first thing that people don't understand about reprobates and this doctrine is that there are certain people that cannot believe to get saved. Because obviously we believe that salvation is completely by grace through faith, not of works as any man should boast. We believe, you know, as the Bible says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the most simple thing in the world to get saved. You put your faith on Jesus Christ and God gives you eternal life. That is salvation. So people will say, well, wait a minute. If it's that easy, what happens if a person who you say is rejected by God ends up believing on Jesus Christ. What, what happens then? Well, if a person were to believe on Jesus Christ, obviously they get saved. I mean, there's, the Bible is, is, is very clear about that. But look at John chapter 12 and verse number 37. John 12, 37, the Bible reads, But though he had done so many miracles before them, referring to Jesus Christ, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Look at verse 39. Therefore, referring to this scripture in Isaiah, therefore they could not believe. Because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. Who hath blinded their eyes? God has. God blinded their eyes. God hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. They could not believe because of this scripture in Isaiah where he says, look, God has hardened their heart. God has made it so that they cannot believe. We have a perfect example of this in the Old Testament with Moses and Pharaoh. If you remember the story of Pharaoh, now, and we're not going to go through all this. I've done this in the past. When you go through the story, just, just read it on your own. You'll see when Pharaoh rejects Moses and he says, you know, who is the God of Israel? Who, you know, he was just kind of of his own will and of his own heart rejecting the Lord and rejecting Moses and not having anything to do with them. But as you get into the story, you know, when Moses and Aaron, they start bringing these plagues and you start wondering, how can this guy continue <laughs> to refuse them as, as the plagues progress and get worse and worse and they have all these frogs coming up and they're dying and the, you know, the waters turn to blood and all these, all these things are happening that's just... I mean, crazy, and they're being, they're being literally plagued by these things, and, and, it's, and it's affecting them, and, and he still refuses to let them go. Well, the reason why is because God, the Bible says that God hardened his heart. He hardened his heart so that he, he couldn't even let them go at that point. And this is a perfect example of someone whose heart God had hardened literally in the Bible. And here, Jesus was referring to, or the Bible here in John 12, not Jesus himself, is referring to the Pharisees that Jesus was doing miracles before. And he's performing healings. He even brings Lazarus back from the dead. Yet, there were many of the religious leaders, the Pharisees at that time, they knew, they said, they even admitted it. They, they took their, their counsel together, meeting together, and they're saying, you know, 
that this man does all these great miracles, you know, we can't deny that. We know that he's doing all these things, but we need to stop him. And that was the wickedness and evil um, thoughts and intents of the people at that time. They were out to kill Jesus Christ. They were reprobate. They were rejected. They could not believe him. And I believe, and this is what you know, the Bible talks about, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost as being the unforgivable sin. In reference, it, when you read that verse in context, it's Jesus Christ. What is he doing? He's performing healings. And in the context, that is when the Pharisees said, he doth this by the, by the prince of the devils, Beelzebub. He said, the things that Jesus Christ was doing, was they were saying that's literally the power of Satan, that he is of the devil, and that's why he's able to perform these things. And it says, you know, and then he goes into the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. When they are referring to the works of Jesus Christ as being satanic, I believe that is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. They were lit, they had the opportunity, and I don't even know if that's possible to commit that sin specifically today of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost because they had the opportunity to physically be there to see all of the proof and the evidence to make it much easier to believe on Jesus Christ when he's standing there and performing all these miracles, yet they still rejected him and they still denied him. And not only that, they went even further to say that, well, this is of Satan. So in John 12, he says they could not believe. It is impossible for them to believe. And it's important to understand this when we look at the doctrine of reprobates, that there are people out there that have been rejected by God and they cannot believe. It is impossible for them to believe any longer. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy. You're already in John. Flip over to the right a little bit to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to see another reference to the word reprobate, okay? Because we saw the first reference. We're going to go later on in the sermon to Romans chapter 1, which is another reference to reprobate. And then, but here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse number 8, the Bible reads, Now as Jannes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So, he says, Jannes and Jambres, when they withstood Moses, they were reprobate. In the same way, there are people just like them that are resisting the truth. They're fighting against God. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ, as we saw already in Philippians. Remember that? Enemies of the cross of Christ. They resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So they're rejected concerning the faith. And he specifically points out here the reprobation that they have, the rejection that they have is concerning the faith in Jesus Christ. They are rejected. Now let's get this a little bit more in context because we're going to see some more attributes that are going to be very similar. I just, we just read from verse number 8. Let's start at the beginning of the chapter in verse number 1. Verse number 1 reads, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Keep that in mind also. Without natural affection, it's talking about homosexuality, it's talking about the sodomites. Okay, not having natural affection. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. They hate people that are doing good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. So, yeah, they might go to church. They have this form of godliness. They may say they're spiritual, but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. Again, another warning. Turn away from these wicked people. Turn away from these evil people. Verse 6, For of this sort, this type of person, are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth? Why? Because they're reprobate. They could learn all they want. They could have the Bible thrown in their face every day and they're never going to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And then, of course, that was verse 7 and verse 8, what I already read. Now is Jannes and Jambres. You know, these also um, resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. There's plenty of evidence in this book 
Now flip back if you would to Isaiah 56 where I had you turn a long time ago. There's plenty of evidence in the scripture that talks about someone being rejected. And it makes sense. I mean, if you think about, we already talked about the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. We didn't turn there. But the Bible says that if someone blasphemes the Holy Ghost, they ask never forgiveness. You can't be forgiven of that. So if you have no forgiveness, then that's someone who's damned. I mean, if someone commits that sin, from that moment, they're rejected. But think about this. That's not the only sin. In Revelation, at the very end of the Bible, the Bible says if anyone adds to or takes away from God's word, he says that I'm going to add the plagues that are written you know, in this book unto him, and I'm going to remove his name out of the book of life. So there's another example of something that someone can do that can cause them to never be able to be saved, to, to, to not have that salvation. Now, I believe that we have eternal life if you put your faith on Jesus Christ. It is eternal. And, I, and we were just talking about this before the service. But I believe that that lasts forever. And I do not believe it's possible for us to lose our salvation. So, in order for the Bible to be reconciled as a whole, when you look at these verses, I believe that it's impossible for someone who is already a believer to, to either blaspheme the Holy Ghost or to take the mark of the beast because that's the third thing that the Bible mentions specifically that those that take the mark of the beast they're going to be cast in a lake of fire everyone who takes the mark of the beast and worships his, his name they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire so I believe it's impossible for, or for a, a believer to alter and tamper with God's word I don't believe it's possible and one scriptural evidence I have for that I'll just read for you from Matthew chapter 24 it talks about People being deceived by the Antichrist. And in Matthew 24, the Bible says in verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So the signs and the wonders that these false Christs are going to be showing, he's saying, is going to be amazing. It's going to deceive the whole world. But, and it's so amazing that if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Meaning that it's not possible for the elect to be deceived. To be the, the believers, you know, those that are saved, to be deceived by these false Christs. It won't happen because it's not possible. So there's one example of something that's it's not possible for, just as much as not possible for a person to be deceived by an antichrist, that's why it's not going to be possible for them to take the mark of the beast because they're not going to be deceived by it. They're not going to take it. But um, let's get back. This is a really deep topic, so I'm going to try to make it as, as compact as possible, but there's just so many ends to this, to, to this subject that I want to make sure I'm, I'm pretty thorough. You're in Isaiah 56. Because the main, the main point I want to get across this morning, I mean, well, I want to make sure we understand this doctrine of reprobates, but it's, it's a warning. As it was in Philippians 3 where we first started, beware of these people, beware of the dogs, because these people exist, they're reprobate, and that's actually the reason why they do the things that they do. It's because they're rejected. We'll get to that when we get to Romans 1. You'll see how it, how it kind of operates. Because oftentimes people will wonder, how in the world can these people exist that are these, these serial killers and pedophiles and people that do these unthinkable things that like, it doesn't ever cross the mind of a normal person to ever do anything like that because they're so wicked and bizarre and perverted and twisted that it's not a, a thought a normal person would have. It's because they've been rejected by God. And God has given them over to that reprobate mind. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Isaiah 56. The first, there's two types of reprobates we're going to talk about this morning. The first one is the false prophet that's a reprobate. That's rejected by God. Isaiah 56, verse number 10. The Bible says, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. Again, there's a, the, the, the reference to the people, they can't understand. They're, you know, it says, they, they all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and we will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, and much more abundant. 
Isaiah is talking about these watchmen, these shepherds that are supposed to be over the flock, but it says they're blind, they're dumb dogs, they can't bark. And this is, you know, just to give you the idea of, of what type of a person is this, this false prophet. It's a guy that's saying everything's good, everything's just fine. You know, you think about a dog that can't bark. And, you know, a preacher, a pastor is supposed to be able to bark out warnings and bark out that, you know, hey, you know, you need to, you know, like, sin is wickedness. The Bible says, you know, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show Israel their sin. That's the job of a preacher. Hey, look, we have things that are wrong. We need to watch out for things. These are important. And, and these guys, the false prophet or the false pre preacher is a dumb dog. They can't bark. It says they're sleeping. They're lazy. They like to lay down. They love to slumber. And they're greedy dogs. The, the, the preachers that preach for, for financial gain, for physical profit. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 covers a lot about the false prophet. The reprobate false prophet. Now, I don't believe that every single person who's unsaved that's a preacher is a false prophet. The Apostle Paul himself was someone who attacked the church, but he was not a reprobate. He was not rejected. He says that, but I did so ignorantly in unbelief. He's saying, you know what? The things that I did, he thought he was serving God. He didn't reject God. He thought that, that what he was doing was right according to his religion. And there's many people out there that are sincere in their religious beliefs. And they may be preaching a false gospel. But, they're, but, but they're not, it's not that they've gotten to the point where they've just heard the gospel and they've rejected it. They just don't know any better. And that's where Paul was. He was ignorant. But there are people who do know better and they have rejected the gospel and they have been rejected by God and they are reprobate. And there are false prophets out there that are out there just to deceive, just to make money, just for their own, to fill their own belly, just to you know, get the admiration of men. Whatever it is, their motivation is wicked. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 warns us of this. He says in verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So let's talk about the false teacher. They come in privately, you know, privily. It means like they're sneaky about it. They come in with guile. That they don't let you know up front. They're going to try to introduce their false doctrine as subtly as they can because they don't want to be exposed. They want to do as much damage as they can before it finally is exposed of who they are with their damnable heresies. Verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. These false prophets, they, they commit their wickedness and a lot of people will follow them. And then because of that, what this ends up doing is it brings a bad name on Jesus Christ. Because you have, for example, the, the pastor, that it comes out that he's been molesting children. Right? Now we know this happens in the Catholic Church all the time. But when it happens, and, and you know what? Even in the Catholic Church, when it happens in the Catholic Church, people are like, I don't want to have anything to do with church. I don't want to have anything to do with God because this guy defiled me when I was a child. And, 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 it, and it ruins them and it destroys just you know, people into thinking that I, have, I want nothing to do with this. <clears throat> That's why it says the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. So the right way, say, no, no, yeah, but, but that guy was wicked. He was a false prophet. You know, this is the right way. I mean, this is the truth. They're, you know, it's still real. God is real and he still wants you to serve him. He still wants you to go to church. That was just someone that was extremely wicked. But the way of truth is evil spoken of because of those people, because of those false prophets that do these things. It says, and through, verse 3, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. 
But if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemning them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under the day of judgment to be punished. I'm going to get back to these verses in a minute. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, get this, and this is all still referring to these false prophets. This whole chapter is referring to these false prophets. But these, as natural brute beasts. What does that mean? As stupid animals. Brute just means stupid, and, and you know, beast is an animal. So he's saying, but these are like just dumb animals made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are in blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. This is the warning. These people that, that, that God is referring to through His holy word as being these dumb animals that are made to be taken and destroyed. Pretty strong language, right? He's saying here, their spots and blemishes sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. He said, these people are going to be among you. And you're not even going to realize it. I mean, you remember Judas Iscariot, the traitor. Jesus said he was a devil from the beginning. He was among the twelve, and none of them knew that he was the traitor. They all asked, is it me, Lord? Is it me? You remember at the Last Supper, after the whole ministry of Jesus Christ, Judas was an infiltrator. He got in. Now, obviously, Jesus knew who he was, and he knew his heart, because he's God in the flesh. But nobody else knew. None of his disciples knew. He was able to get his way in there and feast among them as a wicked, evil reprobate. Verse number 14, more attributes. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. These people cannot cease from sin. I mean, they're, they're so wicked and they're so given over to their lusts that their eyes, they're just full of adultery. They can't look on, on another person, you know, on, on a person of the opposite gender or maybe even the same gender without having this adulterous thoughts in their mind. And they can't cease from sin. Beguiling, and look at this, beguiling unstable souls. What does beguiling mean? It means tricking. They're deceiving. Unstable. Who would you consider to be an unstable soul? Because I could see a few in the back right now. Unstable literally just means someone who's not grounded or founded, right? They're a little bit shaky. They're a little bit movable. Now, that can be, you know, it doesn't have to be a child, but a child is a very clear example of that. Someone who's not shaky. I mean, you can lead a child to do all kinds of things as an adult because they're not grounded and founded. You can get them to do many things, and that's what happens with these rubber baits is they are beguiling the unstable souls, and that's who they look to attack and their predators on these people. It says, In heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Now, if you're born again today, if you, if you put your faith on Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, you're a child of God. The Bible says, but as many as received him, them, them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. When you put your faith on Jesus Christ, you're born again. You are sealed with that spirit until the day of redemption. By the way, another scripture that proves you can't lose your salvation. If, you, if that verse is true, you are sealed until the day of redemption. God has sealed you with that Holy Spirit of promise. You are a child of God just as much as my children are my children forever. I mean, as long as we're on this earth, you know, they can't change that fact. It is a, it is a, it is a bond, it is a relationship that cannot be changed. I am their dad whether they like it or not. When you're born again, God becomes your father and you become his child. But this is talking about people who are cursed children. If you remember, Jesus Christ referred to some of the Pharisees as children of the devil. You're of your father, the devil. And this is what I believe, and this kind of it still makes sense. When you're born, again, just as much as when you're born again into God's family, you can never be removed from God's family. No one can pluck you out of his hand, including yourself. 
You are in his family. You have eternal life. It's there forever. When you become reprobate, you become a child of the devil. And just as much as you could, you can never stop being a child of God, you can never stop being a child of the devil because you've been rejected. You've been born into that family of wickedness and, and just extreme sin and, and people who are just given over to this reprobate mind. That's why they're cursed children which have, have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking the man, with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. And this is the type of preaching you get. This is like the Joel Osteen type preaching. Where everything's good, you live your best life now, hey, everything's wonderful. And you get all these people packed in and, and, and I get my multi-million dollar mansion and, and you know everything's just great and wonderful and allure through the flesh. You know, the people who never want to speak on any type of sin. Because what happens when you preach on sin is that people get offended. Some people get offended and leave when they hear that. Not everyone can handle the Word of God. And it's just, it's a fact. I mean, look at Jesus Christ himself. You say, you know, unless Joel Osteen thinks he's better than Jesus, what happened with Jesus' ministry? A lot of people got offended at his sayings and they left. And then he turned to his disciples and said, are you also going to leave? They say, oh, this is a hard saying. We, can't, we, we, we don't understand this. And they left. They stopped following Jesus. You know, first he got a big gathering when he fed, them, when he fed the, the multitudes with the, with the bread and the fish. Remember, he fed the 5,000 and there's a bunch of people following. And then he keeps preaching. And then they, and then they leave. Why? Because he was preaching the truth. And the people couldn't, they couldn't handle it. There are some things that he was preaching. They just, they're like, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't follow him anymore. And Jesus didn't say, oh, wait, come back, come back. I want you all to stay. I didn't mean it. And backtrack on his words. He said, he turned to his disciples, are you going to leave too? And they said, well, you know, no, you've, you've got the words of God. And um, of course they weren't going to speak. So this is, this is a type of false prophet that's a reprobate. Um, this is, this is, these are their attributes. See, behind the, the closed doors, they're like the Pharisees. He says, you know, outwardly they appear clean. Outwardly, you know, there are these men of God that people look up to and give them all their salutations in the marketplace. But he said, inside, they're full of dead men's bones. They're corrupt. Jesus could see through to their heart. He could see that they're wicked on the inside. That's why the Bible uses the term wolves in sheep's clothing. What's a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, on the outside, they look like a sheep, right? They look, they look harmless. They look like everything's fine. They look like one of you. But on the inside, they're a ravening wolf seeking to, to destroy and that's what, that's what we need to be aware of and look out for and look at the attributes of these people and be able to identify them and say, this is what a reprobate looks like. First, we're looking at the false prophet aspect. He says uh, in verse 19, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. And this is very similar to the wording in Hebrews chapter 6, which I believe was, this is people who get a clear understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They hear that word. And he said it's better for them not to have known the truth about salvation than to know it and to reject it. Because when you hear it and, and it's clear and you reject it, that's when the reprobation comes in. That's when people are rejected then, when God will reject you. He said it's better for the people who just, I mean, they just haven't heard because they still have an opportunity. It's better for them than for the person who they hear it, they understand it and say like, nope, nope, I'm rejecting that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that. Verse 22, last verse, but is, is happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire, referring to these people as dogs again. Remember, beware of dogs. If you remember, that's the that's title of the sermon. Beware of the dogs. So let's go back now to 
in this Second Peter chapter two, he talks about he brings up Sodom and Gomorrah. Flip over if you would. I'm gonna, I'll read these verses to you. Flip over to Romans one. Romans chapter one. We saw a lot of attributes. I know we're going through a lot of scripture this morning, so I apologize if it's too much, if it's kind of hard to, to absorb everything. I mean, there's a lot packed into God's word, and there's a lot of attributes, there's a lot of different um, aspects of, of you know, these reprobates and, the, and this teaching and this doctrine. But um, try, try to stay with me here. There's a few things that we need to get out of Romans chapter 1. Because they, they all tie together. When, when you start reading these passages, you put them side by side and you look at, we saw 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 2, and Romans chapter 1. You're going to see all these similarities because they're talking about the same exact thing. And even in Philippians 3, you know, to, to say these things again is not grievous. And God is giving us this information over and over again in many different places of Scripture so that we can be aware and not ignorant of these people that are out there and be on guard so that we don't allow uh, these things to happen to us. Because there are people out there that are looking to destroy. Romans 1, we're going to start reading in verse number 20. Romans 1, verse number 20, the Bible reads, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. There's a lot of people not having an excuse for getting saved. He's saying you could even see, you know, God in his creation. You can see the power of God. You can see these things that, that we, he's made us so that we could understand our creator. Verse 21, Because that... When they knew God, so this is talking about people who knew God, who knew, you know, I, I believe when he says they knew God, they, they, they know salvation, they know the, what it takes to be saved. They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So, it's all about people. They hear about God. They didn't glorify Him as God. They decided to make their own God. Make their own idol. They say, well, no, this is God. And they make an image like a, you know, a bird or a cow or an ant, you know, whatever. Some animal, some creation of God. They're saying, this is our God. And people would literally worship idols. They would make graven images and bow down to them. And now idolatry still goes on today. I'm not going to get off on that rabbit trail, though. That'll take me way too far off track. But when these people did this, when they knew God, but decided, nope, I'm not going to glorify God as God. I'm going I'm to say, this is God. I have a different God. I'm rejecting God the God of the Bible, and I am setting up my own God. Verse 24, we're continuing here in the passage. Wherefore, God also gave them up. They gave up God. They knew God, but then they decided, no, I want my own God. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever for this cause. Now again, for this reason. Why? For what reason? Because they changed the truth of God into a lie, which meant they knew the truth of God and they changed it into a lie and they started worshiping the creature more than the creator. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. 
For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was mean. This is talking about the homosexual. This is talking about the sodomite. And he says the reason why there's even sodomites in the world is because they've given up God. And God has rejected them to do those things. This is they change the natural use. Now look, are we born with a sin nature today? Yes. Absolutely. So what does that mean? It means if you were to commit, if you were to, to steal or to lie, it's going to come natural to you. Right? Because it's part of our nature. The sin of homosexuality is not natural. That is not something that comes... You, you don't just naturally gravitate as a man to another man. That is against nature. That is not part of our sinful nature. The reason why people become that way is because they rejected God. They knew God. They glorified Him not as God. And they set up their own God. Whatever that may be. It could be... I mean, it doesn't have to be a physical image, right? You could set up whatever God you want. People do it all the time. They don't believe in the God of the Bible. And the Bible, I mean, is it, is it any, could it, could it be any more clear? For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. He gave them up to do those things. And, and multiple times, for even their women did, did change the natural use into that which is against nature. So there it says against nature. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman. It's unnatural. It's not right. It's perverted. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Because you talk about these Yogi Sodomites, they, don't, they get angry. They foam at the mouth when you try to talk to God about with them. I mean, they get livid. If you've, ever, if you've ever seen it or talked to them, like, they get really angry at the, at the conversation of God, especially the God of the Bible. They're fine with a lot of other gods. They're fine with the Buddhist God. <sighs> bring up Jehovah, bring up the Lord, the God of the Bible. Yeah, there's some, there's some serious anger there because they hate God. It says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. There's that word again, reprobate. God gave them up to that, to do those things which are not convenient, the things that don't come naturally, to do those wicked sins. And now we're going to see a, a whole bunch more attributes. Verse 29, being filled. So these people, these people who are reprobate, being filled with all unrighteousness. It's not just a sodomy, it's everything. They're filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They have the pride. They glory in their own shame. Any normal person is going to, you know, all these things that are mentioned, these wicked sins. If anyone were to commit, you know, a Christian were to commit fornication or, God forbid, murder or some of these other sins are listed, that's a shame. I mean, you'd be ashamed of yourself. These people glory in that. They're proud. They're lifted up in their heart. This is not what the world is teaching you at all. The world's going to try to tell you that, you know, the, the sodomite lifestyle is, that is just that. It's a lifestyle. It's just, you know what? They just, you know, that man just looks, man is just like you like women, and that's fine. Just let them do whatever they're going to do in their bedroom, and it's just fine. When no, the Bible, look at what the Bible describes them as. They're given up by God. They're given over to these things because they've rejected God and God has rejected them. They're reprobate. And the way that I see it, the way that I read it is that basically when a person becomes reprobate, God just kind of lifts the restrictions. You know, we're, we're all born with these consciences 
Their consciences are seared with a hot iron. They have no conscience. God has removed any, any semblance of, of their own sense of law and justice and they, they just go out and, and can do all these perverted things. It's no wonder. You know, I've just been listening recently to these different documentaries about these serial killers. And you go down the list, it's not a surprise. You know what they all are? Homosexuals. They're all sodomites. I mean, they all do these things. You look at the Jeffrey Dahmers and, and uh, John Wayne Gacy and these other, you know, all the big names that you know. They're all these, these sexual predators and, they're, and they're, they're reprobates. I mean, that's the only reason why they're able to even do these things because God has given up on them. He's lifted the reins up and he's given them over unto the lust of their heart to do all of these wicked things. It's not a mistake that they all have that commonality of, of being a sodomite. And those same people, for years and years and years, they live in their neighborhoods and no one suspects them. They're eating with people at their, at their feasts. They're, they're going to the, to the picnics and nobody has any idea what they're doing. We need to be aware of these people because they're out to destroy and they hurt people. And we need to be aware of the sodomite and the homosexual and not just be so accepting of them. I'll tell you this, if you have to, my, my children will never, ever, ever once. Now, we don't let our kids out of our sight anyways. I mean, we live in perilous times as it is. Now, I'm going to be preaching tonight about, about um, you know, old-fashioned beliefs. And I was kind of doing some research on the, the 1950s in this country and just all the differences. I didn't grow up then. I was born in 1977. So I don't know, you know, I don't know firsthand what it was like. But I've seen in my short lifetime the changes that have happened so dramatically in this country, in, within the culture of our own country. It used to be that people can let their kids run out and play and not have to worry that maybe some pervert's going to pick them up off the street and defile them and murder them and I'm never going to see them again. That wasn't even a thought 60 years ago in this country. It's a lot safer then. People had a lot more morality. I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself tonight. That's, good night. We got, we got enough preaching this morning. We'll go into that tonight. But it's sad, but I'm never going to let my children out of my sight. And I'm, I'm dead sure to tell you this. It, it makes me cringe when I hear people say that, you know, they get babysitters for the kids and stuff, which whatever, you know, you want to get a babysitter, go ahead and do that. It's your kids. But don't leave them with a sodomite. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, if nothing else, if you're going to have to use a babysitter for them, don't ever get yourself a sodomite, just an open sodomite, because they're perverted. They're already perverted to do these things that are against nature. How do you know that they're not going to do something to your child? They're already perverted. They're all, their mind is already screwed up. I wouldn't let them come near anybody I love with a 10-foot pole. I said, this type of sermon makes people mad today, and you understand why. Because we're, we, have, we have a president in the White House that shines the rainbow colors on the White House because he's such in support of filth and, and you know, people that the, the Bible talks about here, natural brute beasts made, made to be taken and destroyed. People who rejected God, murderers, full of all these wicked sins, haters of God. Beware of dogs. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 17, the Bible reads, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of the Lord thy God. He's referring there the price of a dog to the sodomite. The sodomite that, that goes out and whores himself out and gets money. He says, you don't bring that money in the, into church. But he's referring to the sodomite as a dog. In multiple places in the Bible, we've seen this, and that's um, now. Turn if you would to Matthew seven. It's the last place I'll have you turn. I'm doing okay on time, actually. So it's Matthew chapter seven. And what we have to understand is, you know, as Romans one said, that these people, that knowing that the things that they do are worthy of death. By the way, in the New Testament, knowing that these things that they do are worthy of death. You know, in the Old Testament, God said that uh, you know, if mankind shall lie with man, is lie with woman, both of them shall be put to death, their blood shall be upon them. 
That's the way God views sodomy. He says, that is a sin that is worthy of the death penalty. And I preach an entire sermon on the death penalty and what God view is on who should be put to death. If we were a righteous country, if we had righteous laws in this land, I believe that that sin would be, would be punishable by death. That that crime of sodomy would be punishable by death. Just as adultery would. Just as kidnapping would. I mean, read your Bible. If, if, if it was righteous then... If that's what was right, if that was a just judgment to be given then, why would it not still be a just judgment in God's eyes today? God doesn't change. Now, there's differences in the Levitical priesthood because that's changed. You know, in the ordinances, the cardinal ordinances, and the things that the Bible spells out. Yeah, some of these things have changed. We don't observe some of these things anymore. But that's not the moral laws. The moral law hasn't changed at all. It's still, it's still bad to steal. It's still bad to commit adultery. These things are all still wrong in God's eyes. They're still sins. Sodomy hasn't changed either. Matthew chapter 7. Because this is, this is the, what... Uh, it's just so fitting that, that these verses are all together here. God's so immensely full of wisdom. This is what, what, what I hear probably more often than anything else when I preach on a subject like this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Judge not. Right, judge not. And they stop right there. Right there, There's two words. They see, they, Matthew chapter 7, and it's just judge not. And they don't want to read the rest of the chapter. But see, I mean, I, I'm someone who likes to read the Bible in context and not just stop after reading two words. Judge not that ye be not judged. We'll see what Matthew 7 is talking about. For with what judgment ye judge... You shall be judged. Hey, that's only fair, right? The judgment that you're going to judge, hey, that's going to come around you too. Hey, I believe that wholeheartedly. So the moment that I become a sodomite, go ahead and put me to death. Because that's the judgment that, I, that I'm given. And I'm fine with that. And I, I can live with that. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Now, what is he talking about here? He's talking about hypocrisy. He's talking about, okay, you're, you're kind of talking to someone about this real small sin that they have, and you have this huge sin in your life. You know, you've got this big beam sticking out of your eye, and you're trying to get a little speck of dust out of your brother's eye. You know, you're, you're real quick to judge on the smallest thing for them. That's what this is talking about. We just judge not that you be not judged. When you have these gaping problems in your life and these, these horrible sins, you know, you're out committing adultery on your wife, but you're going to tell this person that, oh man, you played a game while you're clocked in at work, you're, you know, like, and in judging someone else on a much smaller level than, than what you're involved with. But we'll keep reading here. He says, because what does he say? Does he say you can't ever try to help your brother that's got, a, got something small in their eye? No. He says, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Get yourself right first, okay? Get all, your, get all this stuff crap out of your life. He says, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So he doesn't say don't ever judge and, and try to help your brother out by saying, hey, you've got this problem. He says, first, just take care of yourself because you need to be able to see clearly. Then once you see clearly, then you can say, oh, okay, yeah, now, now I can help you out. That's what he's saying. So you can't stop at judge not. You know, it's never okay to judge. You can never say anything wrong about anybody, any sin, any time, because judge not. No. But then he says in verse number 6, and this is what I want to I point out to you. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. This church is a very strong soul-winning church. I believe wholeheartedly in the, in the great commission of Jesus Christ to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, go out. And that's why we have it in our bulletin. That's why we have time set up so we can meet here. We could go out. We could find people. We could preach the gospel to them and try to get them saved. And I believe that is our job to do. And, and it's not being done in this area, but it is now because we're here and we are going to bring the gospel to people. I believe that 100%. 
But he's also giving us a little bit of advice here. He say, well, give not that which is holy unto dogs. When I find someone who is just this open, flaming sodomite, I don't waste my time. I don't waste my time. Why? Because I know that they're rejected. You could say, oh, I can't believe you do that. You can get upset as you want. But I look at these verses that say they're rejected. I'm not going to give that which is holy unto dogs. I'm not going to cast my pearls, these great pearls of truth from the Bible before swine. Because what happens? It says they're going to trample them under your feet and turn again and rend you. They're going to come after you. you say, let them be filthy. Go ahead. Now, that being said, I do give, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt, I mean, to the umph degree. If someone talks a little bit effeminate and they're a man, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and just say, okay, well, maybe he's got a list. Maybe he's got, you know, but you know what I'm talking about when you see someone who's obvious. Okay, when you got a man dressed up like a woman and, and you know, real flamboyant and flaming like that, you know, forget it. I'm not going to cast my, my pearls before swine or give that which is holy unto the dogs. So the point of the sermon, you know, we ought to understand that these people, there are people out there that are reprobates. They're wicked. They're evil. They're looking to destroy. They're, they have evil hearts and they are out to defile people. They defile children. Maybe you've been influenced by this in your life or maybe you know somebody who's been impacted by this and you know the, the extreme... Uh, grief and turmoil that goes on and I mean I can't think of really anything worse than a child being defiled by a predator like that screws could screw up that person for their whole life and one of the things that makes it even worse is that we don't have the proper judgments I mean we have pedophiles going to jail for like a few years and then being put back out on the street what message does that send to the kids oh what he did isn't really that bad it's worse to, to smoke pot than it is to defile a child according to our laws in this country. What, what in the world does that say to the person who's been abused? The Bible says put them to death. Let the child understand, hey, if someone does this to you, this is not tolerated or accepted at all. We don't stand for this. When someone does something like that, they are like a, a, a bad dog that needs to just be put down. Because that is not acceptable. And that is what the Bible teaches on what needs to be done. And literally refers to them as natural brute beasts. I mean, what happened in Sodom? We, we need to get the right picture. What happened in Sodom? They weren't just these friendly, happy people. That's why I don't call them gay, because they're not happy. They're not these happy people. It's a, it's a misnomer. It's a misname to call a sodomite gay. In Sodom, what they do, they, they encompassed Lot's house and said, bring those men out to us that we may know them. And they had evil intent because when Lot wasn't going to give them to them, he said, they said, we're going to do worse unto you than we thought to do unto them. Worse. They knew what they were doing was wicked and bad and evil and they wanted to do it anyways. And they were not ashamed of it. They were proud of it. They went out and the whole, the whole town came out against him. Just like they did with the, the, the man and his concubine that was traveling back and, and he stopped in Benjamin. What happened? The sons of Belial, the sons of the devil stopped by, the Sodomites, and they said, hey, the same exact story, almost exact same thing to the man that invited them into his house. Hey, that guy that stopped by, bring him out to me. Bring him out to us. Why? Because they're wicked and vile. Look, these are the stories that we have of sodomites in the Bible. We don't have any other story of someone who's a sodomite where it's someone's not being abused and, and raped and forced and, you know, and, and having these horrible things happen to them. That's the picture that the Bible paints. I mean, it was so bad that God rained fire and brimstone down from heaven onto the city. He didn't send the angels in there to preach them the gospel. He sent the angels in there to get Lot out because Lot was saved. Lot was righteous. Lot was the one that needed to be delivered out of that. They got him out of that and then God's judgment came down. It's not an easy sermon. It's not an easy topic. I don't like preaching this topic, but it's important. 
And if I have to preach it over and over again, unfortunately, in this wicked world that we live in, then, I, then I'll do it. I mean, it's God's word. He's given us plenty of warnings throughout the Bible to watch out for these wicked people and to beware of dogs because you know what? Sometimes you won't have any idea they're going to be sitting among you. They're going to be creeping into churches, especially churches that are doing God's work and trying to get, and trying to get the gospel out there. Yes, yeah, Satan's got a plan of attack already, trying to split up the church, divide the church, get them to fail by bringing in these, these false prophets with their damnable heresies and, and trying to destroy the work of the Lord and getting the people in place to defile the kids, to, to, to turn away people from ever wanting to have anything to do with God. Well, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the warnings that you have in your word. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to get our heads screwed on straight. We live in, in perilous times, dear Lord. We live in, in a world full of propaganda and where it's very easy to control the masses through the, through the television and the, and the entertainment industry, dear Lord. But I pray that you would please help us to, to be faithful unto you and to your words and to accept them for what they say, dear Lord, and to love them and to just follow the ways of righteousness that you've laid out for us. God, I pray that you please embolden us to give the gospel and to, to go out and preach your word. And Lord, we thank you so much for that wonderful gift of salvation that you've given to all those that believe on your son. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.